At American Airlines, we're investing in our customer experience to make travel with us more convenient and comfortable. Manage your trip with our app, from booking flights to checking bags and more, all at your fingertips. And you can relax before your flight in one of our updated Admirals Club lounges. Plus, with the American Airlines Advantage program, it's simple and easy to earn rewards from flying and spending. See all the ways we're making travel better at AA.com. You are why we fly. Hello and welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith. And this week, as usual, I'm joined by co-host Jay Shabbat. In part one, we're talking about British leisure airline Jet2. And in part two, we'll be examining the latest earnings from Brazilian carrier Azul. Hey, Jay, how's it going? All right, Gordon. How are you today? An interesting couple of airlines that we're discussing this week. Interesting in every respect, of course, is the podcast. But we're picking out two carriers that we don't cover in a great amount of detail traditionally. Uh, Jet2, which is a British leisure airline to distill it down to its bare bones. And then Brazilian carrier Azul, which uh, some of our listeners might be more familiar with. Let's kick off with with Jet2, Jay, or Jet2.com as the livery goes, what have they been up to? Sure, interesting little airline. And uh, let me start by saying we're talking on a Wednesday afternoon, morning-ish afternoon here uh, at uh, East, East Coast time US. So Jet2.com is, as you mentioned, their leisure-oriented airline based in the UK. And they're a bit of an afterthought uh, for, for me and, and I... I, I Hesitate to say that uh, the reason why they sometimes fly under the radar, I think, is because they, uh, for a long time, they uh, were, um, well, they still don't do kind of regular earnings calls. They don't report quarterly. They only report their financial results semi-annually. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're just not, because they're so, I guess, UK-centric, they're not that well-known outside of uh, of the British Isles. So um, they sometimes get short shrift, including for myself, but uh, they do deserve a bit more attention because they're rather large now. They have uh, a fleet of uh, well over 100 planes, and they have uh, a fleet of a whole bunch of Airbus Neos on order, A321 Neos, um, something like uh, close to 150 of them. So not a, uh, a tiny airline anymore by any means. And perhaps most importantly, they are a solidly profitable airline. So in the past, uh, 12, in the 12 months that ended in March, so that's their fiscal, they call it their fiscal year 24, uh, they had an operating margin of 7%, so not dazzling anybody, but pretty pretty solid. And that compares to 8% a year before, uh, 5% two years before. And then if you want to go back to 2019, it was about 8%. So they, you can see pretty consistent all through that, uh, you know, kind of within that 5%, 8% range. So uh, they are, um, they're, they're delivering good results and they're doing it in, as what you can imagine, is a very, very competitive environment with uh, low cost carriers. We all know like Ryanair, EasyJet, uh, even Wizz Air is, is, is pretty big in the UK. So uh, give them, give them credit. Absolutely. And you know, the names you rolled off there, Jay, with the greatest of respect to them, they are not the traditional package holiday airlines that people of my generation and those that came before me might recognize the, the Thomas Cooks, the Thompsons, the Monarchs, the Britannias. If you were around Gatwick Airport or Manchester or Glasgow in the, in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, these were the dominant ways that you got from the UK down to the south of Spain, to Italy, to the Greek islands, to, to stereotype, but to, to boil it down into what we generally did as a nation. We picked up our bags two weeks and we headed to the sun. Um, this is a very, very different operating environment. And Jet2 has been able to sort of find a, a very profitable niche for itself, or niche, as you guys say, on your side of the Atlantic. A little bit of history, uh, Jay, because the first flight for Jet2.com was... February 2003, and that was from Leeds Bradford Airport, which is in Yorkshire, uh, in the north of England, and that was to Amsterdam. But the uh, the actual aircraft company goes back almost more than 50 years. So the roots actually lie in, in a company called Channel Express Air Services Limited, uh, and that was really based in the in the English Channel between England and France, and uh, some some sort of early 
operations in and around there, very, very different business model. Um, and yeah, from 2003, they found the, the, the ledger niche and yeah, they've got some incredible numbers now. They carried 17.7 million customers in the 2023, 24 year, and they're doing it pretty well. You know, they are known in the UK as being one of the friendlier low cost carriers. If there is such a thing, you look at quasi independent sources, uh, TripAdvisor, Trustpilot, those sort of things that, you know, they're generally rating pretty highly, especially compared to their direct and indirect peers. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the route map, almost every flight touches the UK in some capacity, but they are not just based in the north of England like they used to be. They've got 12 airports now right across England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Um, and they've got, yeah, like I said, those, those 12 UK bases. So not bad at all. Not bad at all. What do you, um, you know, looking from an external perspective in the United States, Jay, does the whole package holiday thing resonate to you or is it a little abstract? Yeah, first of all, uh, you know, great, great history and uh, good, good overview of, of their business, Gordon. And I think you captured, captured their essence very well there. Uh, and uh, I believe you, uh, you've flown with them. Is that correct? You can maybe sh share a little bit of your personal experience. I would not claim to be a jet two expert in any capacity, despite reeling off the recent history or not so recent history. I did fly with him last year. That was from Edinburgh in Scotland down to Split in Croatia. And, you know, there was a choice of Ryanair and jet two and the timings worked for us. And I was quite interested to, to try them out, uh, from a industry perspective, full transparency, this flight was delayed, but the communication was really good. And I'm not just talking about a text or something coming up on the on the departure screen telling you when the, the flight was moved to. We actually had people in red jackets, jet blue branded jackets, walking around the departure lounge, letting us know, yeah, this is what's going on, late incoming aircraft, there have been some storms in the Mediterranean. Really sorry, we'll get you on your way soon. It was very personal, it was very human. Um and yeah, very, very different from the experience that I've had with with many other carriers of all shapes and sizes in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and the the mix of passengers, like you say at the very start, Jay, uh, it's very, very leisure dominated, unashamedly so. You might be going from Edinburgh to Split on business in July, but uh, yeah, I, I, I dare say you're probably not. Um, and they're very, very good at pivoting their network from the sort of bucket and spade destinations to ski destinations as well in the winter. Very, very profitable routes down to the Alps and other destinations there. But from a passenger experience point of view, it's a 737-800 standard configuration, not quite as garish an interior. There's no bright rhino yellow around about, but it's... Um, Any bingo yeah, cards? No bingo cards. Uh, no, no, no scratch cards. Um, not, not that I know of anyway. I've usually got a keen eye for a scratch card, but nothing of, nothing of that sort. But friendly crew, quite hospitable. They're obviously very, very happy to sell you a sandwich and a, a drink on board and celeries and the rest, but you didn't quite get the impression that they were trying to to rinse you, shall we say. Right. You mentioned a few uh, airlines earlier in the conversation, uh, like Monarch, Thomas Cook, maybe a couple, a couple others in there that specialize in this sort of tour packaging business where sure. the airline is not selling just a flight, but also a hotel and maybe some other aspects of the of the trip and interesting that a lot of those names that you mentioned gordon are no longer with us including thomas cook and monarch and that is really speaks to how difficult uh, a business this is I and mean, it's very price com competitive and so the next kind of logical question is how does jet do jet two uh manage to do it consistently profitable over time and there are a couple of uh, things I want to point out about that, uh, try to get to the bottom of uh, why they are successful where many others aren't. What's the secret sauce, Jay? Tell us. There are several secret sauces, and I'll tell you uh, perhaps the, the tastiest sauce of all is they are, as far as I can tell, and I was poking around and looking at different airlines around the world, they are of all the sort of, you know, biggish airlines in the world, you know, let's call it airlines with over a hundred planes or so. They are the most seasonal airline in the, on the entire planet. And I'll give you a, I'll give you a statistic, some, some, uh, some numbers that I looked at this morning. So in August of this year, uh, Jetu had 
about about let's say 2.8 million seats, uh, departing seats. Uh, depart. I guess that's departing and arriving. So all their seats like coming and and going. You add that all up, and it's about 2.8 million. Well, in January of this year, they had a mere 720,000. So it's an almost 300 percent differential between their peak month and their least peak month. And that's a huge, huge gap. If you look at, um, for example, Ryanair, the, the gap between their busiest month and their least busiest month in terms of number of seats, is about 74% differential. EasyJet looks like about 100% differential. So you, know, you can see these are still very seasonal airlines, but just not as seasonal as Jet2. Um, even in, I was just looking at some other airlines, like Allegiant is famous for you know, parking their aircraft when people don't want to fly. And, you know, in their, in their case, September is their slowest month of all. And they too, like about easy, like easy jet, they're about a hundred percent bigger in, in, let's see, I guess like July is their, is their top month versus September. But again, uh, jet two is about 300% bigger. Uh, so you can see, they just flex their capacity up and down, uh, based on the season. And, why are they able to do that? Well, one reason is because you mentioned they fly 737-800s. This is an older plane. They own many of these planes outright. They don't have mortgages on them. So the old, you know, the old Southwest rule of, uh, you know, you got to keep keep the plane in the air to make money. Well, not necessarily, not if it's a plane that's paid off and, you know, you don't have any debt, ma- debt payments or lease payments on it. So they're able to, you know, ground, ground planes. They also, this is something you can do in Europe much more than you could do in the U.S. They also have seasonal labor contracts with flight attendants. They, uh, I guess they're doing less. Um, they used to, during the peak season, they would uh, outsource flying through wet leases where they go out and you know rent a crew, rent the plane. They're trying to get it. That, that can be expensive, especially nowadays with the aircraft market, market tight. So they're you know moving a little bit away from that. But that is um, that sort of we call it an accordion style schedule where it flexes, you know, just kind of goes in and out based on, yeah, the demand over the course of the season. That that seems to be, uh, yeah, I think we can call that their number one secret sauce. There are other interesting things that uh, that they do that they've been able to, uh, you know, where they've been able to distinguish themselves. Um, what I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. They do provide um, a sort of better level of service than let's see, you know, I don't want (laughs) to, I don't want to disparage Ryanair or anything, but uh, their reputation at least is for, is for uh, better customer care. Let's call it that. And they, they really go out of their way to try to not cancel flights. And they even have, they hire people even to work on site at the hotel properties that they work with that can help customers when they're, you know, on, when they're away from home. They have uh, their own contact set center. If you feel more comfortable, about 10% of their bookings come through kind of an old school contact set, you know, phone center. You could actually pick up the phone and call someone. So they do a lot of that and it adds cost, but it also probably gives them a revenue premium. Now, 81% of their revenues last year came from tour packages. They sell, uh, you know, seat only uh, fares as well, like the one you bought. Uh, Gordon, but that's only about 10% of their revenue. So it's packaging is what they do. Uh, another thing they're able to do very well is um, they'll, they'll go out and purchase uh, hotel rooms from, you know, hotels throughout Greece and uh, Turkey and Italy, Portugal, all the popular leisure destinations. They're going into Morocco next year. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the usual places where people like to fly or where, where British people like to fly. And they, uh, they're able to negotiate pretty good rates. I think the European hotel industry is pretty fragmented. I think less, m- much more so than the U S for example. So there's, um, you know, I think they can negotiate rather good rates. And then when they resell them to passengers, they get a pretty good markup on that. So they'll say that they're the, the tickets that they sell that are packaged with hotels, that's a higher margin transaction for them than the tickets that they sell where it's just the seat. So that's all good. And the final thing I'll say, you know, just there's, there, there are other aspects of their business model. I don't want to, you know, o- omit any important ones here, but one other thing that they do sort of have going for them is that probably because in part they're so service or customer care conscious, 
they they do have a very strong appeal with an older demographic and that um demographic i think just with you know it's 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 growing faster than the population as a whole um they tend to have higher incomes than the population as a whole so that is um a very important segment for them and it is funny the way they speak and you hear easyjet and others speak about this as well uh, whereas british tourists they uh they they first to give up, you know, food and water before they give up their summer holidays. So I don't know if it's like that in your family, but <laughs> that's kind of the way they, they talk about it. And it's, um, they say that it's just a very resilient, like even, even though the UK consu- consumer is a little bit stretched right now, and there's a lot of economic uncertainty, um, GDP growth, not great. They still say that, you know, demand is totally fine. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the last, and I should say that the last update they gave was a couple of weeks ago, I think it was mid earlier, mid July, and they won't be given another update as far as I know until November. Uh, so again, a little bit of a less, less transparency than we'd have from some other airlines that report quarterly. Uh, but based on what they said a couple of weeks ago, it seems like demand is, is totally fine. Glad to hear it. And you speak about transparency, Jay. It's yeah, it's not an airline that's particularly proactive in terms of media outreach, but one opportunity I did have to hear Steve Heapy, who is the CEO, speak was at the Airlines for Europe Summit in Brussels in March. And he was, you know, he's incredibly straight talking. O'Leary was also at that event, as some of our regular listeners and readers may recall. But uh, Steve gave him a run for, for his money in a couple of respects in terms of his bordering around brash perspectives uh, with regard to sustainable aviation fuel and some of the other macro trends impacting the industry. Very, very interesting to see this sort of quite cozy, family-friendly, customer-centric organization right up with this uh, very straight-talking CEO. And one other thing we should highlight, Jay, uh, before we get into the break, is that we discussed the 737-800s. JetBlue has a huge order with Airbus, uh, with 110 Airbus A320neos, uh, of rather family aircraft, A320neo family aircraft, on order, with the possibility of extending that further up to around 146, I think it is, jets. So this is an airline over the next few years that you're going to see in transition. Um, some of that, of course, will be for fleet replacement, like for likes. They had some ancient 737-300s. They um, still do, I, actually. have a couple have a st- Yeah, There's still a few, got a couple. Just a, few. just a handful, yeah. Um, and there are not many operators, never mind the UK's third largest airline, that have uh, 733s still in their fleet. Yeah, and that raises an interesting point because one of the advantages of flying an older plane like the 737-8, let's put aside the the, the threes, but the uh, the 800s, the 737-800s, which is really the staple of their fleet, uh, because they're they're older, they you know own a lot of them outright, as I mentioned earlier, they become just financially easier to ground uh, in the winter time. Now, if you have a much more expensive plane like the A320 Neo, where you're probably, you know, you can't imagine a company like Jet2, you know, it's, I don't think it's, you know, has quite the financial muscle to, you know, buy them outright with cash. So they're going to have to finance them somehow, um, whether it be through releases or through, you know, borrowing from a bank or whatever, or issuing bonds. And then it becomes, you know, more difficult. Allegiant faced this, this as well when they transitioned from the MD80 to the uh, first day through 20s. Now they're moving to the, the 737 MAX um, and they managed it okay. Now, remember, this transition is going to happen over years, um, probably over the you know course of the next decade. Uh, and they will have these 737-800s for a long time. In fact, I'm looking in their most re- recent presentation in their fiscal year. I guess this is the summer of 2030. They'll still have 52 uh, 800s in their fleet. So they you know, they, that's, that's a big chunk of the airline that they'll be able to ground in, in, in January. Uh, they'll have at that time just for, you know, just for, for your information, they plan to have 105 of the A320 Neos at that time. So about, you know, two thirds of their fleet will be Neos and the other third will be, you know, the, the geriatric 800s. I was going to make a rather cruel comparison to the, uh, the sort of passenger you might find on a JetBlue, a Jet2 aircraft. And the aircraft themselves, but uh, I will leave our listeners to put those two dots together. Um, hey, if JetBlue merged with Jet Two, they could call oh. themselves Jet Two Blue. Jet Two Blue, yeah, get that patented now. It's an excellent name. Uh, 
Thank you for that, Jay. I really enjoyed that. And uh, nice to touch on an airline that we don't get to give much airtime to regularly. Anything to, to mention on Jet2 before we, we head into the break? Well, the usual caveat that uh, we always have more detail on this in, uh, in, the, in the issue. So if it, oh, you yes. find this uh, interesting, there'll be uh, a feature story on our, our friends at Jet2 uh, coming up uh, this coming Monday. So you can check that out. Fantastic. And just a little housekeeping before we get into the break, a uh, quick reminder that you can send any questions, comments that you might have for us and the WADA team to podcasts at skiff.com, our exciting new email address. That's podcasts with an S at the end. Uh, and don't forget to follow or subscribe this podcast wherever you are listening or watching us. I believe we're on YouTube now as well. Uh, and if you're enjoying the show, please do rate us five stars, leave us a positive review so we can spread the word about the Airline Weekly Launch podcast and keep delivering it to you free of charge every week. Uh, don't go anywhere. In part two, we're going to be discussing Azul. Everyone loves travel, but if you're listening to Airline Weekly Lounge, you really love travel. The American Airlines Advantage program is made for travelers like you because it's easy and simple to earn through everyday spend. Your next dinner out can help you earn toward status. So can that online shopping spree before your next flight. Learn all the ways the American Airlines Advantage program works for you at aa.com slash radio. Hello and welcome back to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith. This week, I'm joined by uh, Jay Shabbat. I almost forgot your name, Jay. I've only been doing this podcast for eight months, but we are uh, <laughs> we are where we are. It's high summer. Um, we've been discussing Jet 2. Let's talk about Azul now. Um, and Jay, if you had to describe Azul in a sentence for someone that has never heard of it before, what would you say? Brazilian, low cost, but not really low cost, but very profitable, but slightly bankrupt does stuff regionally, but also goes to the US and Portugal, has some A330s, dot, dot, dot. So that was my rambling description of Azul J. Help me out. Uh, give, us your, give us your take. My English teachers would have called that a run-on sentence. <laughs> and so would I. That was a, a ramble and a half, plenty of uh, punctuation. It was, was one sentence, but uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of commas in there. And I, I'll, I'll be slightly simpler. I think you did a good job, though, of uh, capturing uh, a lot of what Azul is. Um, but just simply put, Azul is, is one of three, uh, one of Brazil's three major airlines. And the fact that it's one of just three is an important fact in understanding that market. So keep that in mind as, as, we, as we talk about them. Uh, I'll start with just some numbers, as we usually do, some headline numbers. Uh, Azul reported their second quarter earnings uh, earlier this week, and that's for the April to June period. They recorded a 9% operating margin, or excuse me, an 11% operating margin. I was looking at LATAM there. They did a little better than LATAM in this regard here. 11% is what Azul did, uh, and that compares to 14% in the same quarter last year. Uh, what we see just very broadly um, across pretty much every airline in the world is making at least a little bit less money this year than they were last year. Uh, cost increases, one reason, but every airline has their own story. But in Azul's case, they had that 11% operating margin, which is you know pretty consistent with uh, their record of you know routinely producing pretty strong operating results. Now, at the same time, this is very unusual outside of Brazil in particular, their net loss, um, everybody get ready for this, uh, negative $743 million, which was, an, which was a net margin of a negative 93%. Now, before getting too concerned uh, about our friends at Azul, uh, a lot of that is just accounting gobbledygook uh, related to foreign exchange movements and what whatnot. But the, but it is somewhat reflective of uh, of a problem that they that they do legitimately have, and that's uh, you know they do have heavy financing costs. They also have very uh, difficult challenges related to the local currency depreciation. So the Brazilian real, um, and I'll see if I can find it in front of me here. But uh, if you go back ten years ago, uh, here it is. So 10 years ago, one Brazilian real was worth about 45 cents. It's now worth about 18 cents. So you can see just huge depreciation, um, even just earlier at the start of this year, it was 20 cents. So it's just been going down, down. And uh, that's a major challenge because this is an airline that pays for its fuel in dollars and it pays for its aircraft in dollars. And 
some other major expenses as well. So that's been an issue. Now, what they say is that over time, they've been able to get fare increases that have basically counteracted the uh, the extra cost through the currency exchange. So they've been you know doing a good job with that. Now, how are they able to get those fare increases? Well, I think you know there's we can go into all sorts of details about what their business model is. They have interesting sort of auxiliary businesses. They're in cargo. They're in you know they have their own tour operator. You know it's uh, going back to our discussion about Jet Two. They do a little bit of that too. That kind of tour operation. Um, they have a you know loyalty program that's that's profitable and growing. Uh, they also have uh, you know interesting network where a lot of their routes don't have any direct competition, so that gives them some pricing power. Uh, and then I think it's very important to note, perhaps more important than anything else, is that there is just three airlines in the Brazilian market. I mean, it's a very very large market, so it's it's less than what you'd call you know a super competitive type. Uh, you know, think about the UK alone, where you know we just mentioned Ryanair and EasyJet and Jet Two, and then you can talk about Tui, and you could talk about you know British Airways does their their thing, Sherwood Hall, and you can go on and on. So Wizz Air. So this is a a much less competitive market, um, and it may even get less competitive if Azul winds up merging with Goal, which is very much uh, under discussion right now, and. You know, the first <laughs> the first thing that comes to my mind is if you were a competition regulator, would you allow something like that? And I'll leave that for the competition regulators to uh, to to decide. But uh, it does seem like a bit of a stretch to go from you know three airlines to two. Azul and Gould, by the way, are already co they already started co sharing with each other, and uh, that leaves really LATAM as the only sort of truly independent airline in the entire Brazilian domestic market. And even Latam, of course, previously Lam and Tam, if I got right. back long enough. Uh, yeah. So that, that's something of an aviation supergroup itself. So it's not as if they're uh, sort of blowing in the wind uh, completely on their own. We should mention, Jay, that uh, some of our listeners might recognize David Nealman's name with Azul. Uh, Neilman, previously of JetBlue fame, and more recently of Breeze Airways, he's still, you know, he, he was a founder. He was, I think, he's still the chairman of, of Azul. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, very much still involved. Uh, so, as yep, he's he's there, and uh, the um, although I don't think he, I don't think he was on the last earnings call. I'm not sure if he does. He used to regularly, you know, if you listen to the quarterly earnings calls that Azul did, uh, Neil Oman would always speak. I don't think he was on the, the most recent one. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely a creature of, uh, Azul is a creature of Neil Oman. Um, as you mentioned, you know, so was JetBlue and, uh, and even he was involved in WestJet over in, in Canada and uh, who else? And Breeze is, yeah, the most recent, as you mentioned, and a, and a few others. He was involved in Tap, Tap Air Portugal for a while. So uh, yeah, a, um, a, big, a big name in aviation. Prolific, uh, some might say. And Jay, what is your outlook for the Brazilian airline market? You know, this is a country that's serving 250, 215 million people, never mind the diaspora, never mind holiday makers, people coming from neighboring countries and further afield. Um, it does seem like there is a bit more consolidation to be had, but it's already a very, very, very small selection of, of carriers in terms of major players. It's, I don't know, have you got a spare couple of billion? Do you want to start a new Brazilian airline? Let's do it. I mean, it, it does seem like a market that's that's fairly ripe for the picking, albeit with a uh, a litany of potential issues, as you would always have in in any market. But Brazil, maybe more so than most. What do you think? Yeah, in all seriousness, it is an extremely difficult uh, market. There's there have been carriers that have kind of entertained the idea. Um, there's uh, you know a few low cost carriers in South America that have thought about, hey, why don't we go into Brazil? There have been some regulatory barriers, but I think less that than just uh, it is a very high cost market, and you're going to deal with these like very very difficult exchange exchange rate uh, issues. Uh, makes it just so hard to plan, and you can imagine you know even even aircraft lessors uh, you know charging an arm and a leg to to uh, you know protect themselves in a market with so much currency volatility. 
So it's it's a it's a difficult to market the jump in. The the other thing I should say is the uh, jet fuel prices are, are unusually high in Brazil, even more so than elsewhere, just because of taxation. So um, it, it is it's not an easy market to get into. Um, and just sorry, as I'm talking, another <laughs> another challenge pop into my mind is that you know a lot of Brazil's traffic is concentrated in just a few airports, and some of these airports are slot controlled. So one that comes, you know. Just the, the big one, or one of the big ones, is uh, the the downtown airport it's for Sao Paulo. It's called Congonhas, or uh, forgive the pronunciation, but um, that is a very high yield airport. It's very slot constrained, it's very capacity limited. Uh, Azul actually recently was awarded more slots there. There were some old slots that Avianca's uh, Avianca Brazil had a wasn't quite owned by Avianca, but uh, without getting into the details of that, they had. Some slots, they went out of business. So uh, some of those wound up going to Azul. Um, so if you're a startup airline, you know, if, if Air Gordon wants to uh, start flying from Sao Paulo, your options are going to be somewhat limited. I know where Air Gordon's flying from in Rio, though. Santos Dumont Airport, which is the downtown airport, right in Copacabana. Stunning, stunning. I flew there, out of there up to Vitoria, uh, slightly further north. Uh, off uh, Rio a few years ago, and I didn't really need to go to Vitoria, but I just wanted to fly out of the airport. It is unreal. You feel like you're uh, almost on a seaplane in the 1950s sort of jet set days. Uh, very, very interesting spot. Uh, we are way out of time, Jay, so I'm going to have to wrap it up there, but plenty more detail, as always, in the Airline Weekly issue, which will be dropping into your inboxes on Monday. And just a, a little note that we will be going on our summer break. Uh, so the next issue after Monday 19th of August will be on September 9th. Uh, so that's the next scheduled published issue of Airline Weekly. Uh, but the Airline Weekly Lounge is not going anywhere. We'll have a couple of special episodes for you, uh, dropping as normal on Fridays, even whilst we're away. Uh, thanks, as always, to Jay for joining me this week, and thanks to producer Monica. Uh, and a quick reminder that you can get in touch with uh, the team, podcasts at skiff.com. That's podcasts with an S. Any questions, comments, feedback, uh, we welcome it all. Uh, and a reminder that uh, you can go to airlineweekly.com forward slash subscribe and get a free trial issue. Find out what all the fuss is about with our fantastic industry newsletter. But it's more, Jay, what do you think? It's, it's, it does it an injustice by calling it a newsletter, sometimes writing to seven, 8,000 words. Yeah, we need a more grandiose description. I don't know what the right, right word is. Yes, uh, newsletter plus plus, something like that. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll work on that for next time. Uh, but thanks, uh, Jay. Thanks, Monica. And wherever you are in the world, thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next time. Whether you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts, please make sure to subscribe, rate us five stars, or leave us a positive review. This really helps us get the word out about the Airline Weekly Lounge, so we can continue to bring you this podcast every week absolutely free of charge. And if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the Skiff channel and hit the notification bell to find out whenever a new video drops.